Thanks very much. Um, as you can see from the bibliography, there's a lot of stuff on there. I'm probably not going to get to all of it. I, I'm guessing, I hope, for your sake. Um, so when I get to about halfway, I'm going to see where I am, and I may end up cutting like all of the literature out of this. So um, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, and you know, in confronting this, I realized that there is a lot of, um, perhaps maybe my topic was a bit more ambitious than I really should have been, I realized at some point this weekend. Um, but what I want to talk about is a particular kind of scientific discourse that we see in um, African American literary history. And in doing this, starting with three distinct passages from some canonical modern and postmodern African American writers, um, and then look back at um, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, African American literature and culture, to see this a, a particular trope of African American identity as mechanical, reproducible, and determined. Those are sort of some some combination of of those characteristics. Um, and this determinism, I suggest, involves the familiar combination of nature and culture that we should be pretty aware of, but also emphasizes the human ability to perceive, manipulate, and control technology in the creation of black subjectivity. So I think that's what I'm hopefully getting at in the long run here. So to start with is a really familiar passage, I think, and a familiar trope of black identity as simultaneously visible or even hyper-visible and invisible, you know, both at the same time. And this is the opening uh, passage of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. So I'll read it. Um, at least I didn't hand it out to you. I'm reading it and showing it to you, but I'm not putting it in front of you as well. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination, indeed everything and anything except me. Nor is my invisibility exactly a matter of a biochemical accident to my epidermis. That invisibility to which I refer occurs because of a peculiar disposition of the eyes of those with whom I come in contact, a matter of the construction of their inner eyes, those eyes with which they look through their physical eyes upon reality. I'm not complaining, nor am I protesting either. It is sometimes advantageous to be unseen, although it is most often rather wearing on the nerves. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, obviously. Uh, and the narrator here confirms David Theo Goldberg's claim that, quote, racist discourse has to be grounded in the relations of bodies to each other and in ways of seeing those bodies, or seeing other bodies, more precisely. So that's a sort of familiar working, reworking of Foucault's idea of surveillance and docile bodies, that, that it's important that they be seen in order to be controlled. And here the narrator has chosen to opt out of this system. In his forgotten basement apartment, the invisible man enjoys his favorite dessert of vanilla ice cream and slow gin, and repeatedly listens to a phonograph recording of Louis Armstrong playing and singing, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? And there's a lot more I could say about that, but I won't, because um, that's really interesting. Um, the interplay here between visual and audible representations of black identity invokes the long history of race in America, and it also suggests the centrality of science and technology to an understanding of black identity. In the grooves of Armstrong's recording, the narrator locates a place where he can, quote, slip into the breaks and look around, end quote. Ellison celebrates Armstrong's ability to make, quote, poetry out of the invisible, to bend that military instrument into a beam of lyrical sound, end quote. This refashioning of a technology that he associates with an indifferent or even hostile state apparatus mirrors the ways in which the phonograph itself, developed by Thomas Edison as a business dictation machine and employed by ethnographers to capture scientific data, came to be an integral part of the entertainment industry and, ev and eventually an instrument for recording, disseminating, and most importantly, creating black music. And so that's more on that later. That's, um, we don't talk about that again for a while, but that's, that's some, something I want to sort of put in the back of your mind there a little bit. And science and technology for a long time before this um, was intimately involved in the, in identifying the visible, measurable characteristics of racial difference in the 19th century, both before and after the abolition of slavery. And so 
Uh, these are just some, some of the more famous, maybe, and egregious examples of how this, how this went on. Biologists such as Louis Agassiz, Samuel Morton, and Josiah Knott devoted themselves to the theory of polygenesis, the notion that human races were uh, derived from multiple origins rather than a common ancestor. So, and this is a well-known illustration from um, Knott and Glidden's uh, book about, about racial ancestry that connects, you, you can see here, well maybe you can't, but if you're near the front maybe you can see, that different races of people are connected with the species of animals that occur where they are native, right? So this idea that, that you know, say Native Americans are somehow analogous to the animals one finds in North America and, you know, et cetera, right? So they don't belong in each other's places. This is, this is a very familiar sort of uh, manifestation of this poly, polygenesis idea in the 19th century. Um, and uh, another example here from, from this same book is uh, some illustrations of physical characteristics of apes and, quote, Negroes and Greeks, right? So, and of course, I mean, it, it doesn't take, I don't, I'm not a biologist, but it doesn't take a whole lot of expertise to figure out that this is pretty much bullshit, right? Um, that, uh, and in fact, there are drawings of skulls that are in no way representative of the actual shapes of human skulls. That in fact, human skulls look like human skulls, and chimpanzee skulls look like a totally different species. But in this, in this illustration, and this is before really um, medical science is really much of a science, um, before there's a lot of, um, uh, ex you know, looking at skeletons closely going on, um, the, il the illustration just has created this connection between uh, chimpanzees and uh, the black race. It just, you know, there's no scientific evidence to support it, but it makes a visual connection to this, this idea that the other races are genuinely different. And this was a very popular and influential text in the 19th century. Um, so racial science, as, uh, as visual cues, changed or began to break down, and as science became more sophisticated, racial science sought ways to empirically identify racial difference and maintain the ideology of white supremacy, particularly with the recognition of unseen characteristics, those properties not detectable to the naked eye. So by the end of the 19th century, these efforts include fingerprinting, intelligence testing, eugenics, etc. many different scientific sort of ways of distinguishing between races. Um, and this slide it depicts Cesare Lombroso, who's this fellow, um, who is the sort of father of criminal anthropology. I think he may have given that himself that name, but it's pretty accurate. Um, he spent his career cataloging hundreds and hundreds of human skulls of convicted criminals, measuring their bodies in various ways and collecting data on their attributes so as to identify the salient physical and ethnic characteristics associated with criminal behavior. So these are all criminals who he notes in his, in his uh, work are all Sicilian um, because they're more prone to criminal behavior uh, than, uh, than he was as a northern Italian. Um, and uh, I'm just saying, that's what he said. And uh, so th this, he, was, he was very important and influential figure in trying to develop um, uh, a science of racial difference that, and, and, and he was, you know, this was, this was the accepted truth in the, for a lot of people. In the wake of Gregor Mendel's discovery of the principles of genetics and the distinction between genotypes and phenotypes, it became clear that visible traits were an insufficient basis for racial cl classification. And this was the problem of race in the so-called machine age at the end of the 19th century. The visibility was no longer reliable. Of course, many people could have told you that all along but science would help provide tools with which to identify and maintain the boundaries of racial identity, things um, that were not visible to the naked eye. Um, obviously, the, the, the principle of race in the United States and, the, and the, the, the logic of slavery depended on visible identification of those who were classified as other. Um, and once, once you realize that that doesn't work, which again, it never did particularly well, then there have to be other ways of scientifically determining racial difference. So that's just sort of some of the background of science and, and race. The second quote I want to give you is from Ishmael Reed's Mumbo Jumbo, um, his 1972 satirical fantasy about the Harlem Renaissance. One of the subplots in the novel involves the efforts of Hinkle von Vampton, who is a caricature of, of the white writer Carl von Vechten, Carl van Vechten, excuse me, and the members of the, the so-called Wallflower Order, 
um, read the Ivy League, um, to recruit a candidate from within the African American community to become a, quote, talking android who will enable them, the Wallflower Order, to manipulate black public opinion and undermine the spread of Just Grew, a pandemic of cakewalking, belly rubbing, bumping and grinding that threatens to overwhelm white America. And I could talk, go on and on about Just Grew and where that came from, but I won't as well. I'm restraining myself. Uh, for the role of the talking android, Von Vampton selects Woodrow Wilson Jefferson, an idealistic preacher's son from the town of Remote, and it's hyphenated, Remote, Mississippi. Since Reed writes, this was the 1920s, black is out, colored is in. The Wallflower Order forces Woodrow to put on skin lightening cream and gives him editorial control over their magazine for the Harlem elite, which is called the Benign Monster. And so he's playing with all kinds of tropes of, of race and in the Harlem Renaissance there. And this is where he describes the Wallflower Order's plan for the, the talking android. The second stage of the plan is to groom a talking android who will work within the Negro, who seems to be its classical host, to drive it out, categorize it, analyze it, expel it, slay it, blot just grew, a speaking skull, and these are all his spellings and punctuation, so don't ask. A uh, speaking skull they can use any way they want, a wrapping antibiotic who will abort it from the American womb to which it clings like a stubborn fetus. And here Reed is obviously playing with the idea of black culture as a disease, which is something that jazz music was referred to as, um, as an epidemic, you know, and, and, and everything that went along with it. What was really the epidemic was, of course, black culture, quote, unquote, infecting white culture, becoming mainstream culture, which um, it did, right? Um, and the idea that, that African American identity is itself a monstrous construction, something that can be replicated, appropriated, and turned against the black community. So this is, this is a, a, another idea that I want you to sort of keep in the back of your mind, this talking android um, notion. Um, the third passage here is from the Robert section of Gene Toomer's 1923 experimental novel, Cain. And this is the opening of that chapter. Robert wears a house like a monstrous diver's helmet on his head. His legs are bandy bowed and shaky because as a child he had rickets. He is way down. Rods of the house like antennae of a dead thing stuffed prop up in the air. He is way down. He is sinking. His house is a dead thing that weighs him down. He is sinking as a diver would sink in mud should the water be drawn off. Life is a murky, wiggling, microscopic water that compresses him, compresses his helmet and would crush it the minute that he pulled his head out. He has to keep it in. Life is a water that is being drawn off. So here, Toomer is um, playing with this metaphor of African-American life in the urban north, which is what happens in this section of the book, as um, sort of an adventure of a deep sea diver, right? Using technology to keep themselves alive within the pressures of an alien environment. Here, the irreg irregularly spelled name Robert, that's not a typo either, R-H, Robert, um, suggests the then new term robot, which was coined in, in the 1920 play Rossum's Universal Robots by the Czech playwright Karol Čapek. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably not. Uh, the Czech word ro robota means, means slave, um, means forced laborer or slave. And it becomes an anglicized word robot really at this time. It's sort of like the way words associated with the internet are sort of like suddenly everywhere. The word robot was suddenly everywhere in the 1920s. Um, and the play tells the story of a company that engineers workers who, quote, lack nothing but a soul. Uh, so there's sort of, a, I think, a, a reference there to this notion of the robot, right? That there's, there's a combination of monstrosity and technology that is, is being invoked in this, in this sort of surreal passage. And Toomer's preoccupation with the modernist themes of urban alienation, personal and cultural loss, and the unnatural qualities of the mas machine age resonate across racial lines. But in the context of an African American cultural history, the connections between technology and identity that these passages highlight suggest a structure of feeling shared among African American texts that involves unresolved friction between the natural and the unnatural. So that's sort of this is the setup, right? This, this natural, unnatural dichotomy that is not a new thing in, in 20th century, uh, or well, not in the 20th century, in, in African American literature, but it's something that runs throughout and, and I think can be traced back to the turn of the 20th century. 
Racist ideology constructed various examples of the not human to associate with African Americans, most notably the trope of monster or machine. Those are the things that are invoked in, in racist discourse of the 19th century. And these tropes reinforce the ideologies of racial science that emerged then. Within the racial, racial logic that perpetuated inequality, the natural state of the black subject was itself paradoxically unnatural, right, as a monster or a machine of some kind. And that's, that, that's the way you justify slavery and uh, systematic oppression, right? So now we're going to switch to African American naturalist writers, um, because that's what I do, is naturalism. Right? So African American naturalist literature at the turn of the 20th century problematizes a notion of a pre-Harlem Renaissance black culture as anti-modern and confronts this paradox of black identity, this natural and natural paradox head on. My approach comes from the perspective of someone who studies literary naturalism, the movement of writers who build on Emile Zola's model of the novelist as experimenter, devoted to an understanding of the ways in which heredity, environment, and chance undermine, uh, or excuse me, determine human behavior. Literary naturalism appropriates the discourse of experimental science and the broadly applied notions of evolution, positivism, and empirical inquiry, and applies these ideas to fictional narratives. Perhaps even more than most novels, naturalist texts are imaginary solutions to real problems. The popularity of naturalism as a literary mode coincided with the rise of Jim Crow segregation and the emergence of a substantial African-American intellectual community of writers, artists, and critics at the end of the 19th century. Then, as now, popular understandings of scientific ideas were often tenuous, opportunistic, and even flat out wrong. Indeed, naturalist fiction reflects some of the most pernicious ideas about racial difference to emerge from this historical period, ideas that were buttressed by a faith in science and technology as the twin engines of human progress. And I would argue that African American literature and culture reflects a complex balancing act in regard to these issues during this period. These writers confronted the systematic denial of citizenship rights, explored the meanings of the, and implications of a black identity oops, lost my place, that is defined through law, custom, and linguistic representation as not white, not citizen, not human. So in order to understand this series of binary oppositions that constitute black identity, I propose, I guess, that we turn to semiotics, because why not? Semiotics, that sounds fun. What could be more fun than some semiotics? Um, so um, the, uh, th this is an example of A.J. Grimus's, uh semiotic square, which... Uh, Jameson calls a rectangle because I think it really is, but, he, but Grimus called it a square. Um, Jameson in the Prison House of Language says that uh, this is designed to diagram the ways in which from any given starting point S, a whole complex of meaning, poss meaning possibilities, indeed a complete meaning, may be derived. So the square identifies three kinds of relationships, um, opposition, implication, and contradiction, right? So these are opposition, S1 and S2 are opposed. Um, there, won't, there won't be a quiz, I promise. Uh, the implication is, is this axis here, and the contradiction is sort of in between. So the way this works, a nice, tidy example of this, is um, masculine, feminine, right? So masculine is, is opposed to feminine. Um, the, un, the implications of feminine is not masculine, and the implication of masculine is not feminine. And the contradictions that are inherent there are what do you do when you have a man who is not masculine, right? That's when things get fun and interesting, right? That's, that's the complexity. Of, so something as simple as defining, saying this is a masculine job or act or whatever, immediately invokes these different points uh, of, of reference and then gives you different places to map identity onto this, right? Or anything that you're talking about, really. Um, does that sort of make sense? OK, good. Because um, that's, that's a pretty easy one. <laughs> Two people have said yes, so that's good enough for me. Um, so what, I, what I'm suggesting here is a, um, a, a way of thinking about this problem that I'm tossing out using this, this, this uh, square, right? So if we start with the idea of natural, right, which is, as uh, um, Raymond Williams says, it's the most complex word in the English language, right? It's, it's a complex word. What does it mean to be natural, to, to, to do something naturally, right? So um, the, uh, the, 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 the opposition to natural is unnatural. The implication of unnatural is constructed. And the implication of, of natural is what I'm calling strategic essentialism, borrowing Spivak's term, which I'll explain in a second, right? Um, 
So if we, if we sort of map out the idea of natural racial identity um, onto this, this, uh, this square, we can locate such categories as things like robots and cyborgs and the post-human, right? That there's, there, the, you know, we have, we have the, the notion of natural constructions and unnatural essences, right? That gives us sort of some of those, those things that concern us and worry us and give science fiction writers something to do, right? Um, that that, that this, this, this is a way of thinking about nature and, and the natural um, that I think is useful for, for understanding how technology and science operate in African American literature. Um, so I don't know if I'll come back to this or not, but this is, again, it's just something to sort of think about. And, and, and here the, the notion of strategic essentialism is borrowed from Spivak, who's, who refers to it as a strategic use of positivist essentialism in a scrupulously visible political interest. So knowing that you don't really think that things are biologically determined, but sort of pretending as if you do for strategic purposes, right? And so this is one way of thinking about the ways in which, uh, say, racial categories, racial stereotypes are invoked or practiced or reinforced by African-American writers or artists or whomever um, for strategic purposes. It's a way, of, a way of sort of thinking about that, right? That reminds us of, of the fact that they are both performative and essential at sort of at the same time. Um, so strategic essentialism is one term that we might use to, to think about Du Bois's argument in his controversial essay, The Conservation of Races, which he published in 1897, uh, five years before his most well-known work, The Souls of Black Folk. And in here he says, the advance guard of the Negro people, the eight million people of Negro blood in the United States of America, must soon come to realize that if they are, going, that, that if they are to take their just place in the van of pan-Negroism, then their destiny is not absorption by white Americans. It may, however, be objected here that the situation of our race in America renders this attitude impossible, that our sole hope of salvation lies in our being able to lose our race identity in the commingled blood of the nation, and that any other course would merely increase the friction of races which we call race prejudice, and against which we have so long and so earnestly fought. Here, then, is the dilemma, and it is a puzzling one, I admit. No Negro has, who has given earnest thought to the situation of his people in America has failed at some time in life to find himself at these crossroads, has failed to ask himself at some time, what, after all, am I? Am I American? Am I an American or am I a Negro? Can I be both? So Du Bois would reframe this idea five years later or a few years later in, in his famous notion of double consciousness in the souls of black folk. But in this earlier iteration, his emphasis on the dangers of commingled blood reflects a commitment to biological difference which is consistent with his training as a 19th century social scientist, both at Harvard and in Berlin. Um, in, his, in, in this essay, as Kevin Gaines notes, Du Bois was clearly searching, if not altogether successfully, for a culturalist concept of race. End quote. Indeed, the uplift ideology that defines African American intellectual work in the early 20th century reflects a notion of evolutionary progress that was the ideological partner of racialized science in the 19th century. And the, the novels of this period that I'm maybe going to look at here, um, if we uh, if I'm stay on schedule, um, reflect um, or reveal a similarly complex relationship with these contradictory definitions of race as biological or cultural category, categories. Um, the, the one thing that we see in, in many of these texts um, is the centrality of marriage and sexual selection within, within naturalism, which reinforces the importance of evolutionary science in these works. Dayland English argues that eugenics, not race, emerges as the dominant American ideology in the early 20th century. She points out that, quote, not all eugenic sympathizers were white supremacists, nor were all white, nor did all advocate racial purity. And eugenics is one of those terms that just kind of got ruined <laughs> with good reason, right? Um, so in the middle of the, of the 20th century, um, it was a highly problematic notion. It's hard for us to see eugenics as anything but bad, really, or as anything that would just be so obviously bad. But basically everyone, and this is English's argument, at the turn of the century, everybody was a eugenicist. Um, there just wasn't really a whole lot of question there, that, that we discovered this thing, genetics, and we, 
if we can find a way to manipulate it and make our lives better, we should make use of it, right? Um, and that's just sort of a given within, within, within Western culture at this time. And African-American intellectuals and writers are really no different. The way that they employ it is, I think, somewhat different, obviously. Or maybe not obviously, I guess we'll see. Um, so the, the, uh, pop, this, this ideology of, of racial uplift um, across the spectrum of African-American publishing, from the popular fiction of Hopkins and Griggs to the more polished literary essays of Du Bois and Johnson, reflects an ambivalence about the extent to which nature, nature explains racial difference rather than culture, that we're still, we're still struggling with that in this period. So some, I'm just going to breeze through these a little bit. So Sutton Griggs, Imperium and Imperio, all of these books are very complex and interesting things. But I'm only going to mention a couple little things for each one. I can go on more, of course, if you want, later. Um, Sutton Griggs' Imperium and Imperio celebrates the creation of a new kind of identity for African Americans. Quote, the cringing, fawning Negro which slavery left had disappeared, and a new Negro, self-respecting, fearless, and determined in assertion of his rights, was at hand. And many people have cited that as the first instance of the term new Negro, which we associate with the Harlem Renaissance. For Griggs, the new Negro is a figure not only defined by an innate capacity for bravery and self-assurance, but also someone who's able to manipulate and control the political, economic, and discursive tools at his disposal. As, it's not, as the novel's title suggests, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's The Sport of the Gods, uh, in, in, in Paul Lawrence Dunbar's The Sport of the Gods, the characters are, quote, powerless against some will stronger than their own. End quote. And their fate is determined by a combination of innate characteristics and environmental forces. There's one chapter called Frankenstein that is about someone who's, whose tendency toward dissolution is encouraged by his environment, and so he, it creates the monster that he becomes. Right? It, it, it again addresses that trope of the monster kind of head on, uh, of, of, of the black male as, as monster. In Pauline Hopkins' Contending Forces, all these titles should give you some clue about like, what they're about, right? The novel's villain, John Langley, is described using the language of eugenics. Langley's nature was the natural product of such an institution as slavery. Natural instinct for good had been perverted by a mixture of cracker blood of the lowest type on his father's side with whatever God-given quality that might have been loaned to Negro by pitying nature. That blood, while it gave him the pleasant features of the Caucasian race, vitiated his moral nature and left it stranded high and dry on the shore of blind ignorance. Another character in that novel makes explicit reference to Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's idea of the heritability of acquired traits, the idea that you can uh, pass on things that are learned, um, that is kind of a discredited idea um, for Darwinian evolution, but, but was very popular during this period. Um, let us cultivate, one of, one of the characters sort of indirectly cites Lamarck, let us cultivate beauty of the soul and mind, which being transmitted to our children by the law of heredity, shall improve the race by eliminating immorality from our midst and raising morality and virtue to their true place. So this idea that you could pass along morality along with you know, blue eyes or something like that is, is part of the eugenic sort of discourse of this period, and Hopkins is, is reflecting that. And her fascination with things like phrenology, heritability, and physiognomy consistently support the value in her text of racial hybridity, one that directly contradicts the prevalent white racist fears of miscegenation, or more commonly called mongrelization, in the discourse of the time. In her discussion of Hopkins' Hagar's daughter, Augusta Rohrbach reinforces the interplay between nature and culture in Hopkins' notion of race. Quote, Hopkins begins with the biological notion that racial identity is an inherited trait, One's past as a way to confirm racial origin cannot be dispensed with. Thus, much of the narrative detail is given over to developing and reevaluating character history. Yet the present also plays an important part in assigning meaning to race. Together, as Hopkins makes palpably clear, the two determine and undermine identity. White fears about miscegenation and so-called race suicide were reinforced by the social Darwinism of the era. Charles Chestnut's willingness to address this issue is reflected in his essay, The Future American, in which he bluntly states that, quote, the future American ethnic type will be formed by a fusion of all the various races now, races now peopling the continent, end quote. Chestnut uses the same words 
deployed by white supremacists, amalgamation, fusion, miscegenation, and argues for the absorption of the black race into the new ethnic type through the selection of healthy, strong individuals of all races. Thus, in Chestnut's fiction, mixed race figures such as Rena Walden in The House Behind the Cedars and Janet Miller in The Mirror of Tradition, like, like Hopkins, Sappho Clark in Contending Forces, are strong, beautiful, as well as physically and emotionally healthy. Or they're all mixed race characters who would be defined as tragic mulattas in, in traditional 19th century texts. But in, in their texts, they're, they're doing great. They're just fine, right? And their, their existence is a direct rejoinder to the popular conception of the mulatto as genetically inferior. inferior. And mulatto, the term itself, shares the, the root with the word mule, an unnatural combination of, of, of a horse and a donkey. Um, that sort of tells you where people are coming from with the use of that term, right? Likewise, James Weldon Johnson's novel, The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, highlights the social construction of race, but the narrator's final words serve as a reminder of the role of nature. Quote, I cannot repress the thought, he bemoans, that after all I have chosen the lesser part that I have sold my birthright for a mess of pottage. End quote. Johnson associates the pursuit of wealth with his decision to pass for white, but the narrator's white father has never recognized his son's right to inherit name, property, or social status. The narrator's reference to the biblical story of Esau reflects, refers not to a paternal birthright, but to the ex-colored man's strange, quote, longing for his mother's people. The inheritance that he has squandered is not financial, but genetic. His musical talent and his gift for improvisation, characteristics bestowed on him by his mother and her race. And these are just some of the examples of how we see this, this eugenic discourse. Du Bois's novel, The Quest of the Silver Fleece, resulted in part from his own sociological work, gathering data for an extended study on poverty in rural Alabama. Du Bois critiques the failures of his own profession with the appearance of a Southern sociologist who says, after visiting the local colored school, quote, did you notice how unhealthy the children looked? Uh, race is undoubtedly dying out. Fact, no hope, weak, no spontaneity either, rather languid, did you notice? Yes, and their heads, small and narrow, no brain capacity. And here he's depicted not only as, you know, sort of a bad person, but a bad sociologist. He's falling asleep, he's not taking notes. He's just not doing a good job. Uh, du Bois doesn't disavow sociology, he disavows bad sociology, right? What he considers to be in, inaccurate record keeping. Um, and this was after he had gathered an enormous amount of data over several years as part of this study in Alabama himself as a sociologist. Um, as Maria Farland notice, notes, Du Bois would appropriate scientific discourse in order to refute the racist assumptions that dominated social science during this era. Quote, adapting racial, racialist concepts and categories, Du Bois transformed them almost unrecognizably, putting them to unanticipated use in a domestic fiction of racial uplift. In the novel, the hope for the future resides in the figure of Zora, the ethereal splendid, who's described as ethereal splendid, like some tall, dark, and gorgeous flower of the storied East just a little romanticized, maybe. Um, within Zora, quote, tendencies merely had become manifest, some dominant. You know, he's using this, again, this genetic language. She would, unhindered, develop to a brilliant, sumptuous womanhood, proud, conquering, full-blooded, and deep-bosomed, a passionate mother of men, end quote. So in all these texts, the question is, how do we account for this eugenics discourse, for this, this scientific discourse that, that is used to describe both visible and invisible characteristics of racial difference. And so the, the quick answer for many, for most readers, I think, is through vernacular theory, through sort of the, the, um, the critical understanding of these texts, appropriation of scientific discourse, has been shaped by the ascendancy of vernacular theory within African American literary studies. It is through this critical lens that we can discuss the notion of strategic essentialism in these texts. So, in the, and I guess I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but essentially, Gates' signifying monkey argues that signifying is the key trope for black creative work, and that by making the white text speak with a black voice, the, the writer is able to both reinforce and undermine at the same time racist discourse, right? So that everything is a double-voiced narrative. Um, Houston Baker's Blues Ideology in African American Literature argues that there's a blues matrix that resolves the apparent antinomies between uh, like the ones we're talking about within uh, cultural notions of race. And in The Black Atlantic, Paul Gilroy suggests that the special power of black musical forms 
derives, this is a quote, derives from their doubleness, their unsteady location simultaneously inside and outside the conventions, assumptions, and aesthetic rules which distinguish and periodize modernity. The anti-modernity of these forms, Gilroy claims, like their interiority, appears in the disguise of a pre-modernity that is both actively reimagined in the present and transmitted in intermittently in eloquent pulses from the past. So vernacular theory relies upon the, uh, an op the oppositional status of folk culture as, it, as an orally transmitted other vis-a-vis -vis the dominant written culture, that that's important to our understanding of, of how we can understand the use of this dominant culture language in these texts. Um, what may be obscured by the focus on vernacular culture as other is its participation in the creation of the modern and its status as a living, changing entity. In performing blackness, Kimberly Benson questions the logic by which Gates suggests deploying what he calls a mask of theory over the black face. The face mask dichotomy indicates, quote, a sacramental or epiphanic logic by which the vernacular is posited as a kind of primal scene or site of originary and salvic truth, end quote. The vernacular tradition re represents a natural identity that transcends the scientific discourse of these writers and defines it solely as an act of dissimulation, a performance, and an example of the dialogic interplay of black and white uh, rhetoric. So the, the, uh, another way of thinking about this is in terms of later theor the theoretical ideas that, that, that building on and responding to vernacular theory and its rise, um, address the active engagement of science and technology in the construction of African American identity. To explain the emergence of the new Negro in part as a byproduct of a qualified embrace of science and technology, not only a rejection of it. So Reed's, Reed's conceit of the talking android recalls the growing popularity in the early 20th century of the talking machine, which is what people called phonographs. Literally, a phonograph means sound writer. Uh, and it speaks not only to the anxieties about white appropriation of black culture, but also to what Ross Posnack refers to as the fetish of racial authenticity within American intellectual history. And so when we look at phonographs, I told you we'd come back to it, and we do. Um, what phonograph promised above all is fidelity. That's the word that we see with, with, with phonograph technology. The ability to accurately reproduce not only the notes on a page, but the feeling attached to the individual performance. So recent critics um, suggest a switch, and this is, notice what I'm doing here, a switch from the oral to the oral, right? Like instead of an oral culture that is anti-technological, an oral culture with an AU that is inherently technological, that is bound up with this technology, right? Um, and if you notice, this is the, the, uh, the logo for, for Victor, later RCA Victor, with his, his master's voice and the dog listening to the phonograph. Probably, I mean, you've seen that probably. It's a pretty familiar, familiar image. And the motto, um, his master's voice, um, calls attention to power and mastery associated with high fidelity, right? Mastery is an interesting word. And a simultaneous ease of one, mimicking a sound, and two, the ability to replace the human with the machine. Right? The idea here is that we are like the dog. We're going to be easily fooled into thinking that what we hear is really there when it's not. That's what's good about, about a record, is its fidelity. Its ability, its, its, its ability to make us like the dog confused and marveling at its, at its wonders, right? That we're going to hear our master's voice coming out of it. Um, Jonathan Stern in The Audible Past um, notes that conventional accounts of sound fidelity often invite us to think of reproduced sound as a mediation of live sounds, such as face-to-face -face speech or musical performance, either extending or debasing them in the process. Within a philosophy of mediation, sound fidelity offers a kind of gold standard. It is the measure of sound reproduction technology's product against a fictitious external reality. So, and this is, we could say this of, of, the, of realism and mimetic literature too. It's making us believe that we're hearing the real thing, but we've never heard the real thing, right? We're hearing something that must be true to, to an external reality that we don't have any access to, right? And so recording technology actually creates the original in the process of making the reproduction. And the original is not visible or marked by any kind of, of, of evidence, of, of measurable evidence. In his critique of vernacular criticism, um, 
Alexander Wehalia, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, uh, argues that the advent of technological sound recording embodied in the phonograph made it possible to split sounds from the sources that reproduced them, creating differently pitched technological oralities and musicalities in 20th century black culture. In other words, oralities and musicalities were no longer tied to the immediate presence of human subjects, a situation that occasions not so much a complete disappearance of the human as much as a resounding through new styles of technological folding. Right? Um, I could say more about that, but I'm going to keep moving. In contrast, Du Bois offers in his Souls of Black Folk, uh, black spirituals, what he calls the sorrow songs, as an alternative medium through which to conceive African American identity. Formally, the sorrow songs are then reconfigured visually in the form of musical notes printed alongside literary epigraphs before each chapter of Du Bois's book. Such reconfiguration of sound into text, like the publication of sheet music, asserts the aesthetic hierarchy that privileges the written over the oral, and simultaneously suggests the inadequacy of this representation. You know, it's, nobody really wants to listen to that, right? It's not really music. Um, but a, a phonograph can give it to us, can give us something that is real. Um, it's sort of like a sociologist writing about souls, you know? It's not, you're not going to measure it, right? It's, it's not something empirical. Um, writers such as Du Bois and his contemporaries attempted to record the facts of African American experience, but they also recognized the ways in which these perceived natural truths could be manipulated, reified, and appropriated. In The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois claims that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, and that these writers' efforts to address racial science on its own terms serve to identify the antinomies of race that continue to confound American society. By asserting control over the scientific discourse, these writers were not simply signifying on its racist logic. They were also laying claim to the principle of a distinctly modern black subjectivity, not as monsters, soulless robots, or talking androids, androids but as citizens. Thank you. <laughs>